this is Kitten Features, and you're listening to Show X Live with Ken in the student accommodation all the way in Scotland. Wait, that was years ago. You're listening to Show X Live with your favorite Scotsman Ken, currently residing in the U.S. of A., and Wayne, mostly from Colorado. Hey, wait a second. I'm on the show, too, and I don't get any billing at all? Well, I know how to solve this. So that did... Fremad Marsh! You're listening to Show X with our favorite Scotsman Ken, our child of the corn Wayne, currently living in Colorado, and Todd, who now has an army of angry Norwegians at his back. Enjoy the show! Hey, everybody, and welcome to the show. You're listening live at 2 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. GMT on this Sunday, the 29th of November, 2020. And today we're going to be talking about AI. We've mentioned it before. We talked about a little bit about machine learning and some of the things Ken does with his life. But we're going to talk a little bit more about what AI is doing, you know, the fears we've had in the past, but what we're really going to see it doing in society today and going forward. Also, uh, we got some catch up cleanup to do. Uh, I've got some emails that I see that I'll get into first before getting into talking about what the VTW clan and squad did yesterday with Asteroid Blues and Star Citizen. So our emails to start things off to kick things going because go figure we talk about MMOs and suddenly people get excited and they want to know more. Uh, Come in where let's see. It looks like we have two cleanups here. So this one first coming from Serathus says, Dear Show X-Men. So it has come to this. I finally got around to send you guys an email because the episode topic is something I actually have things to say about. A week late, but still. That's the whole point of cleanup emails. It's tight. So first things first, for me, an MMO is a game that does not have a hard cap on players. So lobby-based free-to-play games like LOL, World Tanks, War Thunder, not MMOs. Those are 15 versus 15 or 5v5 matches tossed together by the matchmaker. Planetside, Eve, MMO, Foxhole. Uh, now, the this is where it gets tricky. There are several interconnected regions in which a hard cap of 200 players per map. So, Gaiden more gaming. Stop calling yourself your game's MMOs. So, in order. Rift. This particular WoW killer, actually WoW clone, is all right. Yeah, none of the super revolutionary ideas introduced were of any interest. We saw all of them in WoW and other games. I actually played it to the first expansion and had some fun with it. But it's super duper basic crab targeting, hotkey spamming blandness. However, rogues could tank, which is something nice. Apparently there have been no big updates for years. The game seems to be dead. Eve. Now this is probably the most unique MMO out there. A single shard, save for the Chinese server. Uh, arsehole simulator that makes you lose faith in humanity. There are legendary stories about infiltrating or infiltration taking over a year. Battles with seven, several thousands of pilots lasting until the daily server reset forces everyone to disconnect. Weird and crazy people making every single system and the most notorious of all, the market PvP. Because in EVE, 99% of the economy is in players' hands. Everything you buy is from a player and you sell to players. People have to physically move items around blockades and at least one official PvP tournament was won by one team simply buying all the good stuff their enemy would have used. Ha! Ah. Wow, that is such like a trade war type one. If you've got the if you've got the economy for it, do right? That's, that's no, this is par PvP, right? Yeah. It's Why it's not? crazy to hear like that was actually a way somebody went across winning. That's I give it to Eve, and that's actually pretty cool. The latest development was the invasion of not-quite-aliens aided by players who decided to side with them. This ended up with a system flipped to the invaders between the two biggest trade hubs, turning it into Losec, essentially deleting that trade route. The other one was the Forsaken Fortress update. Previously, players owned bases, when destroyed, saved everyone's cargo and items stored safely. Getting it back was costly, but you could still recover your precious stuff. Not anymore! Bases that have been abandoned will drop everything stored. If you stopped playing the game and you kept your stuff in someone else's base that is no longer refueled, someone is going to get lucky when they blow up that place. How lucky? 
When the update went live, roaming gangs started deleting all the abandoned bases with one dropping a bunch of extremely rare, no longer obtainable blueprints. Real money value? Around $6,000. This is Eve. <laughs> Actually, I was going to write about more MMOs, but seeing how this is a long email, I'm turning out to be... I'll be cutting it short. I have played a bunch like Plantside 2 back in the day. The game is continuously getting updated still, but it is way too run and gun for me. I yeah, I, I actually want to check it out again because back when I did play it, it was pretty neat. Um, let's see. Well, I remember the first one, people loved that, right? People were going crazy for that. Yeah, no, I, I had... Especially Warcraft video time. Well, because I remember us doing one game fest where we had 20 people playing together in Plantside 2 out of my basement. That's badass. Man. Which was... That's so cool. Yeah, as an actual, like, MMO-type experience or FPS experience, that was pretty damn neat. Um, Let's see. That coupled with the ever-present half-a-second lag on everything just killed the game for me. Ooh, that would would suck. As for WoW, I've been playing continuously ever since launch, early and mid-Pandaria. I have way, way, way too many hours sunk into that game. My personal favorite was Legion. I think the artifact system was great. The quest felt varied with a whole lot of special tasks to be done, especially in Suramar. The order halls were neat. Most classes had a whole lot of in-jokes and trivia, all hidden stuff to explore. Like the Death Hunters, who were just a bunch of hunters hanging out in the order hall pretending to be Dark Rangers because they are cool. Of note is the recovery of the hidden corrupted Ashbringer skin, which took pretty much every step the th- or theory crafted back in Vanilla WoW on how to obtain the sword just that just didn't exist, but there were lots of clues around. The world also felt more alive with how the NPCs reacted to you. Unfortunately, it seems that Blizzard used up all of their in case of emergency ideas with artifact weapons, the Legion, and Demon uh-huh. Hunters, leaving them completely dry for BFA. BFA was a mistake, and I all I can muster for Shadowlands is cautious optimism. The whole covenant and soulbind system seems to be carefully neutered to be mostly balanced in a way to be boring and bland, not to give anyone any special advantage or exciting ability, to avoid everyone using the same cookie cutter builds as it always happens when choice choices actually matter in an MMO. This from Sarathus. It's when it comes down it comes down to maths and it's optimality. So yeah, it always does come down to that. The way they make it interesting is to make it optimal for different types of things. Like you can have uh, certain builds are optimal for mythic dungeons. You have certain builds that are, are, you know, ideal for raiding or PvP or single target versus group and so on. So th- th- that's the best way to do it. It still means there's going to be certain optimal builds and you don't get much customization. It's more of what you want to do you can customize. Yeah, and and Ken, I'd, I'd simply add to that. The other way that you can make uh, variety in your game is to is to create as many possible outcomes that are within one standard deviation of optimal, which to me is is what you, anybody should be aiming for. Yeah. Like if you put character build and button pushes and all of that stuff together, and as long as you can come within a standard deviation of what optimal is from the theory crafters, like at that point, I don't care. Uh-huh. Like yeah, and again, that's a personal standard, so it is. There is a little bit of uh, your mileage may vary uh, aspect to it, but um, in terms of performance in MMOs, like I really don't care what you do as long as you understand what optimal is, make the choice to play less than optimal, and your less than optimal play, all things being uh, all things being considered, is is pretty close to what optimal is. Oh, agreed. Um, and as for the Shadowlands comment, I'm not going to go deep into this because obviously that's not today's topic. Um, however, uh, now that Shadowlands has dropped uh, on Monday, um, and we did the last show obviously last Sunday, um, I can say that uh, the new Covenant stuff and all the new things that they've, they've, they've done for a while, it feels really refreshed, feels like a new game in many ways. I'm actually really impressed by it. Um, there are some problems, of course, one of which is actually, the, I'd say, the complexity of the, the new systems. There's actually, there's so many different systems that are entwining and can improve your character, or, and there's choices to be made that are semi-permanent, that are tough to change, that you know may be optimal, may not, but it largely, again, depends on your game style and your gameplay. If you want to have more, you know, uh, a character who can jump around the screen more, you can do that. Whereas if you want to increase your DPS, you can do that. If you want to be tankier, you can do that, right? And all of these will depend on what you want to do. So I think that's a good a good approach they've taken. Um, and I'll leave it at that. <laughs> say there, I know there's a lot you have that you can say as you've been playing it uh-huh. a lot. Uh, uh-huh. Serethus finishes <laughs> with a PS saying, you know what my dream MMO would be? 
Something that no one would make and barely anyone would play. A VR World War II MMO FPS with War Thunder uh, Arma levels of simulation. Actually, they're not that realistic when you look at it. Battling on air and land with a logistics system, commanders would have to set up forward bases, AI convoys would move supplies, AI would man the defenses while players attack and defend, let's say on a 500 kilometer square map. Yeah, not going to happen. You say that. So I love that idea. If you split it into, and see, here's the problem. There are a couple of problems, and I just wanna I just wanna talk about this for a couple of minutes. Uh, number one, we know what happens, right? So if you were going to do that game, like the first year of the first game is like 1939, right? And your race would be Germany, Britain, France, Italy. Poland, the Soviet Union, America, right? That kind of thing. And then you would play a set of quests, but like if you play it as America in 1939, there wouldn't be much to do because America wasn't <laughs> in the war yet, right? Yeah. So you'd have a bunch of, you know, it would be about dig, it would be a bunch of, of like fetch quests to dig in air quotes America out of the Great Depression. Whereas Britain and France and Poland and and the Soviets, Japan, China would have a little bit more to do. But by 1944, right, if you're if you started as Germany, like I want to play as a German soldier in this realistic World War II MMO. By 1944, there's not much going on. Like all you get to do is spit at people. <laughs> I mean, Syria, like you know, the the Germans, uh, the Germans were in full retreat on both fronts by uh, <clears throat> by the end of 1944. So if you're going to do it historically and drop a new expansion, uh, a new expansion of every calendar year of the war, for argument's sake, just to make the uh, just to make the content clean, like we know how that ends. So. Um, the other problem that you might have is that the German tech was better for the first three or four years of the war. Oh, absolutely. So it's like, I want the best, I want the best kit. So I'm going to play Germany and everybody plays Germany and nobody plays Poland. Well, I mean, right. Or nobody, or nobody plays France or nobody plays the Benelux. But uh, I still think Benelux you can, nation, I think but. you can balance things like that. It's, you know, in the gameplay, it's one of those things that if people are choosing to play like the Germans or something, they may be limited with how many people can be on their side versus, you or know, maybe it's randomly allocated. Yeah. Or, or things where you have to have maybe multiple other groups against the Germans, like the actual allied pack having to get together so that you could balance out some of those roles. But I mean, mm-hmm. I, I like what he's saying in the sense of he wants a very in-depth kind of VR experience. I mean, it oh, sounds like he's wanting yeah. the closest thing to a person actually experiencing something like that by having uh-huh. it, but one in VR to be heavily accurate. I do like what he says about having an, the AI role in the game being to kind of supplement what the real players are doing such that the sure. real players can actually continue doing things. And it maybe would help make the world feel bigger and more alive. I actually was appreciative of that kind of play in Titanfall in the Titanfall series, uh, those two games, because they had a whole lot of AI kind of units that would just come in that would likely not turn the tide, but were fun to have in there because it gave you something to do to build up your, you know, resources and stuff outside of being able to one-on-one gun people. Mm -hmm. So what if they, what if they did this? I'm sorry, can I cut you off? That's right. Go ahead. Uh, I was going to say that um, he suggested that the logistics, etc., are controlled by an AI. Personally, I think it'd be really fun to have it not controlled by an AI, and, and logistics like a specialized role that you can take up if you want to. Be, it's actually a really tough problem you need to solve. I think. Oh uh, no, I think that would be awesome. I think a lot awesome. of people who do simulation type games would really enjoy that. No, but I do like having AI there to fill things, just to make the world bigger, to make it feel more impressive. So, because in like Titanfall, I think it was on. Honestly, I think it was like a. Was it a 10 V 10 kind of setup or something like that? But it felt like it was a 40 V 40 because uh-huh. there were so many other roles being performed in the game. Um, so I, I, I like his idea. 
I do like the idea. Although for me, it's still a level yeah, until yeah. I get my immersive VR suit that I can run in and not get nauseous in an FPS. It'd be tough Haptics, for me. Haptics, yeah, yeah, yeah. So what if they what if they did a thing where if they they had content releases that that denoted the years of the war, but if if, uh, if a if something happened that prevented World War II from breaking out, right? And I'm thinking along the lines of Hearts of Iron 4, where if you play as Germany, you can choose to try and assassinate Hitler. And Interesting. Reestablish, reestablish the German Empire uh, and bring back Kaiser Wilhelm. Uh-huh. Right? And, and reestablish the Kaiserreich. Um, and, if, and if that happens, right, then... World War II takes on a very different kind of flavor, right? It might be, it might be uh, the Soviet Union and the Chinese communists against uh, an allies of Japan, Poland, uh, Germany, Finland, the Scandinavian countries, like something weird like that, right? Where, where the Western powers don't necessarily even get involved. Or... You know, there's a, a scenario in which, uh, at one point, uh, the Germans try to assassinate Mussolini. Mm. And if that goes south, then suddenly Italy's on the side of the Allies, right? Because they just tried to, because the Germans just tried to kill the the their leader. Um, but I, where, where if you get to this scenario where World War II is done, right? Everybody's character stays the same level, but the content reverts back to 1939. Hmm. And you get to do the whole thing over again. Interesting. Right? Well, uh, and, and the, it's cause I, I, I do love the idea. I like that. I like that idea of being able to, on a first person level, rewrite history. Yes. No, I think that's where right? any of these kind of things get interesting. And I think, and I think that would be really awesome. But I also am, I would also be concerned about, you know, what do you do when, you know, uh, France is no longer a a democracy. You know, what happens if the communists take over France? Well, I think you know, maybe yeah. maybe nothing. Maybe everything happens just the way. Uh, just the way it it does uh, in in history, or what if the Brits go fascist? Like, what if Winston Churchill gets ousted as as prime minister, or what if FDR loses the election in America, right? And the United States goes fascist or communist? Like all of the things that can happen uh, in Hearts of Iron Four if you turn off historical focuses, like all the weird stuff. Um, and as long as as long as if as long as when the servers got to uh, got to a degenerate state, that dev would pull the trigger on um, sort of resetting it back to 19, 1939, but not affecting character development. Okay, that's a fair point. And uh, thanks very much, chat, for getting us into uh, a discussion on how to make a video game uh, interesting and fun that's history-based, because that's going to just make us talk for hours. Yep. So thank you for diverting us for 10 minutes there, chat. <laughs> Blame you guys. Job, chat. <laughs> we appreciate it. Now, well, we say this, and then our next follow-on email is going to do more of the same. Uh, this one coming to, of course, our ally, uh, Ionis, as... He writes in about MMOs, probably one of his favorite subjects, and thus the appropriate wall incoming. And I need a drop in just for like that. Something that's, you know, Ionis incoming. Yeah. You know. So from, <laughs> from Ionis titled Cleanup, the perfect MMO. On the last show, you guys asked a question. What would be the best MMO for you? What MMO would you make? Quit what you play now or would make you, sorry, quit what you, you play now, quit your job, quit that long-term, long-distance relationship with your Canadian girlfriend, and move back to your parents' basement. Well, here I am to tell you about my personal massive online multiplayer, Kryptonite. And it is put in an internet, uh, was it 
free that fridly, I guess. Friendly. Ah, there we go. Top 10 list. Clickbait. Thumbnails with half naked gnomes. Number one, MMO RPG. The sense of what progression thing? and development of the character, either through leveling or obtaining gear, seems to be important to me. Good for long term enjoyment. MMO RPG seems to be a logical choice. Settings. I don't care. To be honest, if everything else is good, franchise doesn't matter. I'd rather have some generic. Uh, original setting than some universe that either takes a lot of suspension of disbelief to accept the game loop or is limited by the source material. Besides, while I can be a bit of a lore hound now and again, I have a deep lack of appreciation for fanboys on Overdrive. Telling everyone who wants to listen or not how something doesn't make sense in the lore, Blood Elves joins the horde. We know it already. Just shut up. To be fair, I demolished my shrine to Chris Metzen when TBC came out. Three, plot. Don't care even more. Make it cliche. Good vs. Evil, Order vs. Chaos, Pirates vs. Ninjas, or if you're really edgy, fans of Kurtzman Star Trek vs. fans of the good old Star Trek vs. the one contrarian arse who says he loved Enterprise. Hey, wait a minute. While I loved on, Enterprise. While we're on that topic, by the way, rest in peace. Uh, the original Darth Vader actor passed away yes. today. Oh, yeah. David Did just pass away. Uh -huh. Yes. Saw yep. that today. Number four, leveling. Short, sweet, challenging. Make it 20 levels cap. First five levels, you got some training wheels on. After that, the difficulty goes up. Making leveling teach you how to handle end game content. Obtaining 20 buzzard peaks, wizard or wings, tails, legs, feathers, and heads taught me nothing about how to not stand in the fire. If anything, I became oddly obsessed with taxidermy of birds of prey, still not helping with the fire thing. Step one. When you see fire, don't stay. Ah, I'm dead. Healer, noob, GTFO. Okay, five, solo or group content. Yes, I do think players who enjoy playing on their own should have some type of content for themselves. Something to justify spending $25 a month on an MMO subscription while playing it as a solo game. Single player content should have its place, hopefully far away from group content. However, $25, number six says, yes. I want a monthly subscription. Money adios. Give that fat guy in the suit his share. Let his wife take half of it in the divorce. I don't care. $25 a month. When you count the inflation, interest rate, macroeconomic predictions in the entertainment business and continental drift, we can safely say 2004's $15 is today's $25. But those $25 subscriptions come with an oath, a blood pact, a suicide note. However you call it, the developers of such a game promise never to have any form of in-game store. No DLC, cosmetics, consumables, flying crystal ponies, 27 exclamation point t-shirts, nothing. Hey, that is some I, damn I, good I loot that you guys should be that. looking for from us. We're happy to give you your exclamation points. Number seven, the core. So we have some leveling. We have some solo content. But what is the selling point of the game? Where all the kill kids want to be? Well, it's an MMO, which should be part of the game that matters. Gather a bunch of friends and fight some creatures who are up to no good. This is the core of the game. Keep it vibrant, creative, and focused on sustaining different types of playstyle without trying to squeeze every square peg into a regular tetrahedron-shaped hole. The map, the myth, the legendaries, number eight. This is probably the hardest thing to do on the list. Design a system that will be both complex and still transparent, so that if you're not a major math or major at math, you can still sort of understand what is going on. To squeeze the last out of your character, you'll need to dive deeper. The art of giving dedicated people a chance to pursue perfection while still providing average Joe with systems he can understand and enjoy is really important. If I tell you this helmet gives you plus eight blob, but the other helmet gives you plus four blob, but also plus four flab? If you don't understand what blab and flab means, and which is more important to your character, you won't be able to make an educated decision. And without that, agency slips away from you. And no, shoving legendary down everyone's throat does not count as a good system design. Number nine, PvP. Yes, let people duke it out however they want. Arena, battlegrounds, events, snail racing contests, hut, ball, whatever. You do, but don't you dare sell this PvP as anything else than a gimmick as some side stuff to do and obtain some fun rewards. Keep reminding people, if they want proper PV game, they should play something else. Even better, make the gear in PV PvP less important by the cooperative cohesion over brute force. 
Do you remember the good old days when the underdogs in Arathi Basin won because they could better manage their team while Alliance would fight in the middle of nowhere scoring meaningless kills? I don't know why I said Alliance over there. It could have been Horde as well. But let's just be serious. It was Alliance. Oh gosh. It says, isn't it racist? I have Alliance friends. Wait, am I an Alliance player? At least we had stables. Number 10. Ah. <laughs> Visible autoerotic asphyxiation. What? Last and least on my list are graphics. Don't get me wrong. I like good graphics. I like to have my archaeologists with all the polygons they need. If you catch my drift. Oh, yeah. You know what I'm talking about. I hate it when Indiana Jones hat was just a triangle with a pointy top too. <laughs> Still, I don't need my perfect MMO to have top of the line graphics. I'd settle down for with something a bit more modest, but with a very distinctive defined aesthetic and art style. There you go. Cool internet list. Follow, like, and subscribe. That from Ionis. And I want to give. I want to say Ionis. I, I liked that. That was that was that was like wow. You had me going. Wow. That that was quite a yeah. bit for me to get my tongue so, around. So is this is this Ionis' ideal MMO of what he thinks it should be, or is it just like what he thinks? What like? No, it's what he th th it's what he wants out of MMOs. Okay, fair enough. All right, fair enough. I, I agree on many points. I don't think the the end game shop should not exist. I don't care. I don't care if you have an in-game shop that has cosmetics and stuff. Hey, if people are willing to shell out for stuff that makes my game cheaper when I don't pay for the stuff, I'm all for it. I don't want to pay extra to not. Well, and and this is this is the friendly reminder that video games for some inexplicable reason are not subject to inflation in any way ever. Yes. Right? <laughs> strange reason. Oh. I think it's because of their digital projects and they just they're, they're they're more accessible these days, so they get more sales these days. So they don't have needed to be, you know, you still put in the same amount of work, but then you get more money anyway. Sure, like I un I understand that at least conceptually, but at the same time, right? Everybody who works on a video game's pay, in theory, goes up every year, right? Like. Even even yeah. if it's even if it's less than inflation, right? Uh, it's still or what you know what inflation is, um, you know, nationally or whatever, however you want to measure it. Um, <laughs> so the cost for these for these companies goes up. I understand that the console manufacturers take a bath on the first. Uh, the first, however many units of the uh, of the new console that they sell, but by the time, uh, by the time you get to the last year of of a console's lifespan, like the per unit costs are so low that they're making money hand over fist when you buy your second or third PlayStation Four, right? Uh -huh. So there's that, but at the same time, you know, software is all dev teams and design teams and test teams like it's all people like the technology that they do the design work on sure gets cheaper over time i suppose but anytime that you're doing something in a new engine there's new technology that comes with that that the you know the company has to has to put up the cost for so like all of these things are subjected to economic forces and i it's just That's never true. i never really understood why there were riots whenever anybody would suggest that the price of a video game go up a little bit uh, to cover the the increased cost of, of the dev and design and test team. Maybe it's just because uh, gamers are so absolutely riddled with nostalgia. <laughs> That we that we do, we 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 almost enjoy having the same prices every time and paying that same amount for each game, and we so we riot because we don't get that nostalgia factor for pay, paying for the a different price. Sure, that I I suppose may, that that could be, but at the same, you know, I'm I'm still uh, uh I still don't I it just doesn't I I remember back in the day paying about fifty bucks for video games, um. And this is back in the in the in television era, um, and the the cartridges were that expensive, right? And these are these are massively simplistic games compared to anything that you would get in the in the two thousands, uh, or to you know to say nothing of twenty twenty. So, um, you know, it's it it seems like we've 
as gamers have cut off our nose to spite our face. So we give $50 video games, but every game has to have some sort of cash, uh, some sort of cash shop. And we're sure. reliant and we're reliant on dev to be ethical enough to not sell uh, things that, that benefit the player. Yeah. Oh. Huh. We have been thoroughly uh, sidetracked, however. Uh, do we have any well, more emails? No, those Sorry. are our cleanup. We're very happy to get okay. them. Love hearing from you guys. Yes. And, you, and great call to action of coming through with what I asked last time, which was to tell us about your perfect MMO, and you absolutely did. I also want to throw a shout-out yeah, to Sepenser in the chat for having provided a an attempt to answer what Octil said about the standard deviation uh, equation of what it means to be player uh, good or not, he has a question. I'm going to actually include that in the show notes so that people can describe and talk <laughs> about what would be the you know way of calculating uh, optimal performance, essentially, or how it affects the game. Uh, so I, I snagged that from you, Sir Penser. Thank you for that. Uh, that's great. All right. I think it is time for us to transition in and talk about, well, I was going to kick things off. I'll try to keep it short so we can definitely get into AI. As the other thing, but I wanted to do a shout out to the VTW and Asteroid Blues Star Citizen clans. We also like to give updates when we hear news or participate in some of these bigger group gatherings. Um, as much as we talk about the subjects on the show, we like to highlight our community. And so we had an opportunity, a big shout out and thanks to Asteroid Blues, uh, one of our personal followers, members that you'll see in the show on occasion, Preacher, who tends to set these things up. Uh, one of the lead uh, administrators of Asteroid Blues, they are this massive corporation or organization within Star Citizen of people I've known, uh, some groups and others, basically a whole bunch of guys who are really geeked out about the prospects of space, flight, things like that. And so they've gone all in with Star Citizen, even though it's still in its alpha state. Well, they hosted another event for us. They do it about quarterly, if if we're lucky where a lot of their members basically in the purchasing they do of assets for the game will acquire things that they're willing to share. And so they provided, I think it was five ships, game packages and ships and a lot of miscellaneous items for people to raffle, win and things and participate in events yesterday in a gathering they did in association with both Star Citizen's free kind of what they had like 11 days or so of being able to play for free if you don't already have a ship package as well as they have their yearly expo, which is kind of a silly thing, but it's like going to a big car show, if you will, for their spaceships that they put an actual environmental thing into the world where you could go view the various ships that they have on hand. In a lot of cases, open them up, get inside and look all of it. Very same reason car dealerships do it, right? They want people to get excited for the new models or things they haven't bought themselves with the option that they could turn around and buy them. Cause guess what? Everything's on a sale you know, while, while the expo is going. And so I know it generates them a lot more money, but for our sake, what's great about it. it also gives us a reason to come together as a group. And so what I wanted to share was kind of talking through as well as some screenshots from the event that we did, uh, to help kind of just talk through some of the fun that we had in play. So I was going to share screen here, hopefully again with this new layout, see if it comes through, right. Um, although I guess I won't do that one and I'm going to show some of the screenshots I took from participating with the group. And so I will get these up and then I will, Ooh, see, good thing. I clicked on this to move this in the right place and I will start talking a little bit about what we did. So let's see, get to the first shots from the actual event. I have a lot of screenshots. I take whenever I run around with people and I'm not the one uh, piloting. <laughs> And so you end up with a lot of extra things. But here we go. As I transition over to show what it was we were doing. So they planned this massive event that basically was to meet up starting at about noon my time, 2 p.m. Eastern, and to run all the way through 8 o'clock Eastern uh, time. So about six-hour event to hang out and get people together. In this, they had multiple plans of things to do, uh, meet and greets, walk around the expo, looking at the ships together and kind of talk about what we knew and liked of them. And stuff like that, as well as some competition, raffles, and things like that. So with those, one of the first competitions we actually got into, I think, you know, I don't know if I took any screenshots of the melee. I have to find this one. No, I, I missed the first one. We we got together. We talked. In fact, Creature just arrived. Hey. Um, and after doing that, we 
uh, got together on board this ship, which is his, his uh, Carrick, this massive, massive ship he's got. And we stood in the front landing bay, which you can kind of see with the ramp down. And everyone got out of all their armor, and we basically had a big old-fashioned brawl. So it flew out into the middle of space where we wouldn't get in trouble for things, and uh, get in trouble for hurting each other, and beat each other down into the last man standing, which gave everybody added uh, entries into the raffle that we were that were being hosted for each of the various That's things fun. happening. Yeah, and as uh, Future said, it was the deck the halls event, and literally deck each other in the halls, and. Um, <laughs> I, I feel good because VTW showed strong. We had the top three participants in it. I think I remember it was myself in third place. And I want to say, was it Serpenser? Did you get second? Or was it someone else who got second in that? And then nice. Campo got first in it. Um, and what that did is that gave each of them, each of us more entries. And they used one of the texts. That, and thank goodness for, you know, shout out to Preacher, also to Blues Kid, because uh, this younger guy who hosts a lot of this stuff is a another big advocate and proponent of the game. He goes out of his way to make some real slick things. You can actually check out his Twitch channel, a blues kid. And if you watch it, you can see he pulled clips from the melee and watch that happen as everyone's running around. I forget how many of us there were total, something like uh, 10 to 14 of us at a time kind of running around together. But um, he did these whole highlights and he did little spin the wheel things for prizes afterwards. Um, that, like I won the one prize I won was a combat knife. So in game, I now have a knife that I can wield, um, which is one of the minor um, ones, as well as we had people getting costumes, different helmets, armor sets, other weapons, some laser pistol type or lightning pistol, and lightning uh, sniper rifle that people got, uh, as well as the big packages, which were various ships, including we had someone new that came on and through the randomness of streams and such, I actually saw Campo streaming out on the VPW gaming site, not the show X one on Twitch yep. and saw it there and spent about an hour trying to get our attention because Campo doesn't watch his stream. Uh, like the chat eventually got hold of uh, our buddy pause and was able to get, send invites to us in game, get into the game and join us. But he actually oh, cool. won like, I think one ship and another thing right off. And he wasn't even affiliated initially. Um, and then we also had a guy who had come in on the free play and he wanted the game package. So he now owns a part of the game and can play regularly, but they gave out, what was it? Five ships. And the big one at the end was the Mercury star runner, which is a beautiful ship in its own right. It's basically based off millennium Falcon. But then after the melee and I, and I will say this is a side of a whole lot of glitches and things happened because star citizen alpha and probably the most hiccups we had had in servers at the time that any of us had played this. But we did manage to complete the important things. Uh, coming through, I always take shots uh, again because I think the artwork's beautiful. I think the ships are beautiful, the engine, everything. Um, one of the things taking off from Mycotech as we were getting ready, I think, to do the melee. Um, looking out the top of Preacher's ship, which is just looking down at New Babbage. Beautiful shots and such. And then kind of shots of everybody on the ship together hanging out, which is also fun because these ships can handle multiple crew members. Um, and it's rare that you get enough people on the crew with you. So these kind of hosted events really help. Uh, we had, they have in the game, I forget what they're called, the pox or something. These little, uh, basically they're uh, little penguin type characters in the game that you can actually buy a plush of, I think. But they were going to be for a little egg hunt thing we were going to do in a cave system, but we ran out of time because of glitches. And then and this is kind of what it looked like getting ready for the melee before everyone took off their armor. Although that wasn't the actual melee. Um, but I did get us as we came back to new Babbage was we set up for a race and I really enjoy the race events. And this is another one where preacher goes out there. Picos. Thank you. P preacher, uh, for he rents all of these for us and then spawns them all, gets them all set up. And in this case, he did it in a way where he then turned around and took his really big ship. Uh, what did he have? The hammerhead or something? One of the bigger ships flew it out over the city for us all to have at a mark point to fly to and then as everyone raced toward it, he flew out to the other side of the city and you had to navigate your own way around or through the city to go find him. Again, the first three people getting more entries in the raffles for the extra ships and the items coming out, which I thought went really well. But we all got lined up, took off. And unfortunately, there were random things. Apparently, the group that I went with to the left a little bit found what must have been water 
because we all magically exploded out of nowhere <laughs> uh, while <laughs> others were able to make it. Uh, yeah, there's still things that are, you know, it's an alpha. But it's great because even in that, and here's like an example of going through one of the hangars and just seeing someone's ship upside down broken in the hangar. Like, why? And Campo had some really great shots around some of the rest of that. Um, and then after I died, I went and grabbed one of the guy's ships and flew over to kind of watch the end. You can't really see it, but in the far distance, kind of this small little uh, dark spot in there for people watching is a preacher's ship in the hammerhead as he was flying over to finish things and kind of coming down That's to cool. catch the people who won. But it's just, it was really neat to be able to participate as a whole group together through the thick, thin, good, bad of it. Um, it's just a lot of entertainment to be had together. And so... We should, be, uh, we should do a special show X sometime. I say we. Uh, maybe, maybe me and Todd could like take off for a, a week. And you could have all the guys on. And you can all talk about you know your ships and the latest things that you're on. The updates oh boy. of the game. And <laughs> have a specific show for that. We could. We could probably do a full pickup on Star Citizen and where it's at. Because I do often get whenever the stream comes up. In fact, Tom Bad Guy mentioned or asked when I was going live with it is like, so what can you actually do in the game now? And it was like, oh, and I get, I could only give them like this quick little throw of like, here's a bunch of stuff you can do. Um, because even though it's an alpha, it continues to expand. And I feel like I've got my money's worth for it. And I, and I know a lot of the others who have put way more money than I have into the game feel like they're getting their money's worth out of it. So it does have value, you know, even though. How is their uh, player base? Like, is it expanded? Do they feel like, are they making profit already or is, are they just start holding? <laughs> are they making off profit? Off? The game has not launched yet and has earned almost $300 million in crowdfunding. Okay, I'll and, stop. <laughs> <laughs> You know, with individuals like myself on a lower, lower end, because I eventually did get pulled in to buy a second ship. I've spent a hundred dollars cash of my own on the game. You know, I got original pre-order and then I got a cheap sale on another. I know of people who have easily spent. And I always say like the bat last citizen con, they hosted a year and a half ago or so when they talked to someone who had put $7,000 into the game and we had looked, and this is where it gets to that level of, I am not someone to say, go put money in the star system. I will not advocate that. I will tell you the real of what it is and what I do with it. But there are packages. We talked about it yesterday when you look, go to the store package thing and see how much you can spend. I think the most expensive single package, which gives you everything in the game ever, is like $35,000, which is in explicable to me. I, I mean, that is just whole. Yet I know people personally who've spent several thousand dollars on the game. So, you know, it, we joked about it saying that it, the $35,000 package is the, I want to win the game the day it comes out. And thus I got it and I own every ship. That feature says it's the Bezos package. <laughs> nice. <laughs> that's pretty good. <laughs> that, that's good. That's good. That's good. That yeah. is good. But no, I, this is just something I wanted to bring up in general because I, I really appreciate Asteroid Blues and the effort they put into some of these events to make a game that we already enjoy even more so by getting that group together. You know, being able to provide a little bit of a nexus that says, hey, instead of everybody jumping on when you can, let's set aside some time to play together. A lot like you said, Todd, previously about any experience you're going to have in a game is better when you get your group of people dedicated to play together at a time, right? Oh, and so sure, even though yeah. this was like a one-shot it absolutely came through where we were just having fun, hanging out, joking and yoking yep. kind of thing. So yep. massive shout out to Preacher and the Blues for hosting another really fun event. Um, and that's something I'm happy to bring up for anyone in the VTW community on our show. If you do something, you want to send in an email and let us know about it, I'm happy to showcase it because a big part of this is so showing how everyone else out there, we are a bunch of gamers and we like to get together and have fun. So, you know, please share with us. Hi. That's what I had on that. I think I've talked more than enough for a bit. So, Ken, you had brought up something about AI as we were talking about for the show. Could you lead us into a discussion there so I can take a few drinks and get things over there? Sure thing. So, um, just to be clear, we're not just talking about AI. AI is going to be part of it. But we want to also be talking about um, largely about automation. Um, now, that can be software, but I think the way most people think of automation now is more to do with the hardware and the physical side of things how it replaces jobs in particular. So today's discussion is going to be uh, centering probably around economics mostly, because I think one of the most interesting things is 
um, discussing how in the past automation has come to be and replaced people's jobs and livelihoods and how that was often seen as a bad thing and you know fought against by many for example the the creation of the printing press put a lot of priests out of, out of, and monks out of, uh, out of their ability to transcribe from one book into a new one for example um, which was very sad for their personal economies um, however in reality looking back now we're like that's ridiculous so um, it's interesting to think from that viewpoint how are we going to look back at how we're going to be handling automation today in the future? Um, AI is a big part of that because uh, artificial intelligence is, is, is used uh, repeatedly for um, replacing tasks that are manual and sort of menial um, into something that's, you know, that can be just done with the touch of a button and then it's done, it's working forever for the next five years. Um, so where is it all going to go? Where are we at just now? And what have we done in the past? And uh, our various viewpoints on that from the perspective of economics, uh, of computing power, um, of hardware power. And that's going to be our overall topic. Please do send any emails if you have any thoughts on this as well. We might not get to them today, but we'll if, if not, we'll get to them next week. And it's vtwshowx at gmail.com. We're very interested to hear what you have to say about, um, about this as well. Um, so let's begin. Um, the reason we want to talk about this is because uh, a couple months ago we touched on this topic for about 15 minutes in a show, and then we said we could probably talk about this for a whole show, and then we decided that we would, pretty much, and that's today. Um, so I think we all have various things we wanted to talk about. Um, so uh, let's let's begin by going over, over our each individual um, points of view as to where we are with automation and our sort of individual perspectives of where it will go in the next, let's just say the next five years first. I think that's quite a hard question because I think if you say a hundred years, it's much easier to say pretty much everything will be automated. Um, but I think the next five years is a much more difficult question. Um, Todd, since Wayne wants a, a break for right now and his voice deserves it, do you want mm -hmm. to give us your thoughts first? Sure. Um, I have a, con my, a conditional my my prognostication for the next five years is conditional. If uh, some sort of minimum wage law gets passed in America, for example, um, automation will accelerate in America to the point where within within the next five years, I can see <clears throat> I can see the partial adoption of automation in retail sales, food service, logistics, um, um, you know, the, 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 we'll call them pilot programs or trial programs um, before large scale rollout um, in the five years to come after that. So it's 2020 now. If a minimum wage, if a minimum wage law gets passed, say 2022, uh, then by 2032, I would expect um, full-on uh, rollouts of automation in a whole host of traditionally uh, low-wage, um, low-wage jobs. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also going to bleed into uh, over-the-road trucking like freight hauling uh it's going to bleed into it's going to bleed into tra public transportation it's going to bleed into um it's going to bleed into cab or personal transportation um as a service uh it's going to bleed into a whole lot of people and uh i simply want to finish off what i'm saying is <clears throat> finish this prognostication bit off by saying, well, I understand that every industrial revolution that has come before this one um, has displaced some number of people and that the uh, societies in which that displacement have happened have not only recovered, but have recovered and then some from it. I don't think we have ever seen an industrial revolution that's going to displace 30% of everybody. And we should all be prepared for that. Not uh, that you should build a bunker and start <laughs> stockpiling freeze-dried food and toilet paper. I just think that you should be ready for... <clears throat> I think you should be ready for a whole lot of people not having work, not being able to be retrained, 
and mm-hmm. leaders who are incapable of reacting preemptively or swiftly reactively to the that changing landscape. That was that's a very good uh, overview. Um, and then that last point as well, Todd, about the about, um, the the thirty percent. Um, I think that's a very I think it depends where we say five years, thirty percent. Yeah, that could that could be that could be achieved, especially in certain sectors, right? Um, and, and, and you you point, you point out a couple. I think lorry drivers is one that's coming up very soon. There's there's trial runs in Europe um, of, of you know driverless lorries, trucks and such. Um, I think we're seeing that a lot more in, in manufacturing warehouses. We're seeing it with the PlayStation Five. I think the, the the factory in Japan, I believe, only has five workers or something like that. Four. Um, Four workers. Sorry, I overestimated. Um, they only have four workers, and that's where the majority of PlayStation Fives are produced because they just they just did the automation to such perfection that as long as there's an input, there will be an output. They don't need anybody to do the middle the middle management really. Yep. Um, and if we're doing that to such an amazing process, can you imagine if we got that with food? We do we do largely already. I mean, generally speaking, you you hear about um, farmers having to fly over the fields to count the number of animals. That's because they don't really see them up close otherwise. <laughs> it's all kind of automated now. There, there, there are drones, there are uh, you know, uh, farm machinery that maneuver the animals around. Um, generally speaking, the, the only time the meat's actually seen is often when it gets to the consumer or in the, the shop. Um, and that's, that's insane. Um, but I imagine that's only the beginning. So 30% is a good, is a good number because uh, it's, it's kind of a, a generic number, I think. But I think in some industries, we'll probably go up to 95 in the next five years, 95%. I think in other industries, it'll be maybe 1%. Yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, no, just it's... to clarify, Ken, when I said when I said 30% of everybody, I mean 30% of the whole population. Yeah, just like a gross you, number. If you, total up, if you total up logistics and retail sales and, and fast food and uh, cabs and truckers and snowplow operators and... Uh, and you know a whole host of other things in that ilk. Like, and you take that number and you add that all up. I, to me, it comes out to be about thirty percent of the total population. Yep. So not sure. just thirty percent of an industry, but thirty percent of everyone. Yeah. Um, that makes sense. Being displaced in some way. Um, no, I so, think you yeah, did just, put that together really well, Todd, and kind of describing. Mm-hmm your look at how you see things potentially happening. I know like from my perspective, uh, I think just automation in general probably exists at a greater scale today than people are aware. Um, especially because so few everyday people see the manufacturing processes behind so many of the things that we enjoy. You know, you can think back to early, early days when you first went out of the individual bespoke kind of creation of items to the first manufacturing lines, right? Um, and famously, right, how Henry Ford did such a big thing with Ford and the Model T, creating the first people's car, something people could afford because they made the cost of production so little. Um, right. And how that has since progressed throughout pretty much everything we do. Um, there's very few things on any kind of mass level that don't have a lot of automation involved. Um, and you know, I, I've been to a couple minor factories here and there. I've gone to like celestial seasonings up in Boulder to see their tea factory down to, uh, a vitamin company. I know then seeing how theirs all processed and you see the amount of personal people touching things isn't all that much. Um, and that's really just, I think a result of the way technology progresses and kind of the necessity of, I think, any position we have where you want to be able to minimize cost and risk of producing something to maximize profit and availability of what you're providing. And so it just yeah. makes sense. And I know in a way that's not hardware based, but from the work I do, one of our biggest selling points or things to work towards right now is automation. That automation has been a buzzword has been a big thing to push and the way we've interpreted it at work in our group is anything we can do to remove repetitive steps so that the people who are using our tools can spend more time doing what people can do best so there's two sides of that where i see with automation where it is and where it's going in the next five years i agree with todd that there are a lot of jobs that we currently see people 
doing. A good one to look at is the transportation industry. Um, we already have seen that even in personal driving, right, we have some level of automation of driving or supplementing human interaction with the road in what Tesla is doing and a lot of other cars. They even have it in across almost every fleet. You have some form of assisted braking, alerts, uh, lane uh, maintaining your lanes when you're driving, things like that, that the car itself will drive. My 2013 Ford Escape will auto parallel park for me and actually does a pretty mm-hmm. damn good job of it, often better than I can. Um, and mm-hmm. so there's levels of that that I think is the first stages of where you see automation hit. And so I think we're going to see big things like transportation, especially long haul, where You have to deal with one of the human limitations, which is alertness on the road. A computer does not lose that, right? A person can fatigue. A computer does not. Um, Sure. A computer can can be monitored, like, mm -hmm. remotely. I can see a scenario where there's two people in the cab of a truck, right? And the truck drives city to city while the two people in the cab, one's monitoring to make sure the computer doesn't fail, and the other one's resting, right? And they switch off every say four hours, but when they get to a when they get to a major metropolitan area like Final Destination over? type stuff, then the humans take over and drive that last leg. I think that's uh-huh. where you're going to see our immediate transition. Like within that five years, that's how you're going to see it done. I believe you already see companies pushing it towards the full automation. There have already been examples from major like semi builders or large truck builders like Mercedes and. Um, I'm trying, you know, again, Tesla has their own truck, but I know Mercedes has demoed their own fully autonomous rig and things like that. And I know there's trial going on in the U.S. Also, like public transportation, you said right now, trains, buses like that are probably the first ones we'll see that become fully automated. You already have yeah. trains that basically are in a lot of places. And so now getting why to, not? they're easy, right? Yeah, they're on yeah. fixed rails. You know, the things there's very little you have to do as a train. Um, that a person well, has to a driver to detect people and, walking and in the front. the loop between the traffic management system and the and the trains themselves is just an SCADA system, right? If you can do satellite command and telemetry, you can do <laughs> you can do terrestrial command and telemetry. Yeah, you have a lot better right? connectivity. <laughs> Which is which is all it is, right? All, all it is is a is a set of passenger compartments moving on a fixed path. Yep. Communicating back to a command and control hub. It, it's like, not hard to conceive. Fumble. And it's it's a problem we've already basically solved uh, in many senses, right. just applying it to these areas. So I think also along with that, I do agree with Todd in that people who are currently in jobs that are repetitive that have minimal extra steps you have to do should be concerned if your goal is to stay in that job and to keep doing that until you no longer need to work. Um, Okay. Well, I'm just saying this is my perspective, right? That I do think those people should be aware and looking for other jobs on the flip side of that. I also have hope though, in that I believe from the good side of it, like the, If we can free people up, like in my job, analysts from having to spend their time figuring out the tool and doing the heavy lifting of acquiring the data they want to analyze or doing the repetitive manipulation of the data to get it to a state that it provides meaningful answers. And if those steps, this is again, software level can be automated, which is what I'm trying to help do. It frees those analysts to instead focus all their energy on making those analytic decisions, those things that say, now that all the information is put in the state that normally would have taken me a week to do by myself, the system now does it for me in an hour. I can spend all my time making sense of it and providing the information out to those people who need to action on it. And so for me, that's what we're trying to accomplish. And I hope a lot of automation is put forth that way, that the ideal would be it frees people up to do things people do best. And so in, yep. yeah, in five years, I think we're going to see kind of like what you said, Todd, I think you're going to start seeing it. I mean, Sony's already doing it, right? Anything that's a repetitive manufacturing job, you're going to just see more of it. And you're going to see less individual people doing manual labor uh, in the yeah. process. I'll, I'll give you the, I'll give you the retail sales example. Um, when I first moved to Norway in 2015, there were 
at least two as many as four or five people manning checkouts, Mm -hmm. right, at, like, the grocery store. Today, there's one. Except for at the the peak of peakest times when they'll open multiple multiple cash registers, but it's all self checkout now. Yeah, once they did self checkout, it completely changed the amount of people they had to staff for those kind of things. Yeah, and I don't mean to sound doom and gloom, but there's a huge policy discussion that has to happen, not just in America but in Europe too. And no one that's currently in authority is equipped to have that conversation. In what, in what sense are you talking about specifically? Uh, in, in what are you going to do with the 100 million people that no longer have an income and can't be retrained to write pseudocode for the robots? Yeah, right. Okay. Because, yeah, you're absolutely right. There is, there is this um... – okay, what that's actually a really good point for discussion. Well, it's not just the okay. policy, but also so, what makes what makes something that is um uh what makes a job non automatable. Okay, no. So let's pause there for a second. Let's take a quick break. Uh, you know, feeling out for the <laughs> Ionis in the crowd. Let's take a quick break, think about that, and we'll come back and actually discuss on that point, picking up what makes something something only a human can do. So we'll come back. We'll take a quick break. Enough for me to like, honestly, quench the thirst and refill some water here. Um, we're going to listen to a really quick song from this one is Joren de Bruin. Live a live or live a live. I think it is or live a live. Um, it's giant robot bonanza from OC remix because we're talking about robots and automation. So I figured we'd enjoy this. So we'll be back just after this in about just over two minutes. So we'll be back real fast. on btwproductions.com. Hey, everybody, and welcome back. Todd is still retreating. Well, and that so was, was a very short break, to be fair. That was very I mean, short. I, I told you, it was like two minutes. So <laughs> I said it was going to be short. The only thing with the phrase two minutes is that it, it doesn't usually mean two minutes. It usually means an amount of time that is not too long, but not too short. <laughs> no, every time I bring up anything about the timeliness of the break, 
and the music plays because I literally look over at what I've queued up for music and read like how long it is. And so I look it up and it said two minutes, 20 seconds. So I said, oh, a little over two minutes. (laughs) Well, I am going to be accurate with what I present to all of you as an audience. Be aware. (laughs) So anyhow, uh, before the break, we were getting things together about automation, AI and everything and that continuing in there to now focus on, well, why would any one activity, job, thing that people do be considered something for automation? What makes it unique in the sense that this is something either a human, only a human could do or something anyone can do and thus automation may apply. Uh, apply. Ken, you were getting into that. Yeah, so um, I, I shared a link in the Skype chat. Feel free to, to throw that up on the share screen. Um, I think an easy point that people often feel like they can say is, oh, well, AI can never create a true art. And that's a lie, um, as you can see from, from this. Um, so the way that neural nets and deep convolutional networks and deep learning in general, all these kind of machine learning techniques, don't worry about all the things I just said if you don't understand them. They're just different <laughs> types of AI. Um, the way these, these types of AI work is that they're fed a bunch of information and learn from it, right? As simple as that. And other AI don't. Other AI sometimes just work from the get-go, even though they don't necessarily have any knowledge yet. They just they learn as they go kind of thing. But deep learning and the, those kind of techniques, machine learning techniques in general, usually require some kind of input first. Um, and such an input um, can be, for example, here's 500 paintings, uh, or here's... 2,000 pictures of cats. You now know what cats look like, and it'll learn from that. Or here's the alphabet. Or here's handwriting. Um, that kind of thing. All these are, are very useful for working out how how something looks like. And it's not just for looks. It can also be used for other things like um, mathematical concepts, working out what stars look like, whatever, right? It can be used for pretty much anything. Um so that's uh, that's 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 generally how how um, what people say is that they can't make art. And uh, I'm just looking at the the Twitch stream to see if we have it up because it takes forever to load. Yeah, you'll see there's loads of art here, right? Stuff looks like paintings, looks like drawings. It can be realistic. It can be more artistic. It can be surrealism. It can follow very specific, um, you know, um, uh, types of art, not just um, you know all look like paintings they can actually be the different uh, genres and, and varieties and time periods uh they can learn from and it's it, and you can argue well it's not original because it's just learning from other stuff and then copying it but i i can present to you quite simply don't we do the exact same uh, i mean if you if you hand a child who can barely speak english and tell them to draw a surrealist painting <laughs> without any context <laughs> right they're not going to manage they, they like they can't humans can't do that Yes, we can create art without any context, and arguably that's where we come in, is that we can come up with the, the very extremely novel idea. But I'd argue that the vast majority of our ideas are not actually novel. They're actually still based on some previous learning and understanding. Um, we're very good at improvements, gradual, slow improvements. We're not very good at brand new novel ideas. And um, AI are actually very good at emulating what we do. And the reason for that is these techniques are actually based on neural networks within your your brain, right? Uh, The idea of neurons passing information back and forth, just like how your memory works, just like how your nervous system works. Um, So they're actually very good at creating art. And and, and there's actually been, you know, galleries that are dedicated to showing art created only by, by AI. Um, there's been appraisers who don't know as you know that some paintings are made by AI, and they'll say, "Yeah, that's definitely from that time period," or "Yeah, that's definitely worth a lot of money," or "Yeah, that's even definitely by the original artist that we're talking about." That's happened because they're so good at reinterpreting things and drawing them that way. Hmm. Um, in the chat, we're having people talking about the idea of uh, generating faces as well. That's true. Um, AI can also generate faces, and uh, we've seen this this huge problem with. Um, AI being able to generate faces in video, not just an image, right? So you can uh, actually make it look like somebody is saying something or doing something. It can also emulate voices. So if it gets enough clips of, say, Obama speaking, it can eventually learn to generate something that Obama would say. And Things uh, that you hear from uh, the deep fakes, as you often hear, basically yes. using AI routines, machine learning, things like that to emulate or to represent someone 
in a situation that's not actually them. And often it's done in simple ways of just layering someone who never actually did or said something over the video of someone who did and making it look like that person actually did say it. But taking it to that next step is you can completely fabricate things from nowhere. And that's bringing that points up interesting because that's, I think, one of those concerns that we all have to have going forward as the technology continues to improve. Um, not to get into the specifics of any commentary about what has happened with it or not, but you already see, I think, recently, especially how quickly misinformation can move around the world. And now uh, having yeah, tools to make it even easier to create something that looks legitimate, sounds legitimate, but is not, you're going to have people who just consume that and unfortunately don't think enough about whether what they're seeing is accurate. Yeah, and that, that's, and that's more the that sad truth is that in the near future, our politics and uh, uh, who we vote for and stuff is going to be, have to be verified by certain channels, um, certificates of sort um, to say, we verify this is legitimate and has not been modified. That's going to be the, the new, the new. Well, medium. they've talked about because that. That's no something. That yeah. That's something they're trying to figure out ways to be able to authenticate, prove whether something has been faked or not. And it's getting harder and harder yeah. to do. Um, I do give credit. Uh, Babs in the chat says something I think is kind of a uh, poetic in the sense of saying for art, what is art without inspiration? AI art. That's what. Um, so if, if, if art is, is more important, if what is important about art is the intent used to make it, the, then that means that the art itself is, is worthless, I would argue. Because I think we should actually appreciate art for well, the art's sake, not just the intent behind it. Well, I would always say that from whatever I I mean, I guess art is what I'm going to say is it's unique to everybody's experience of it. I always thought that art is more importantly what you yourself take from it, what it invokes in you versus what anyone else thinks or what anyone else did to provide it. Like there's one thing anyway. when I, yeah, anyhow, that is completely no, aside please, from ahead. the conversation. Yes. Um, I, the reason I bring up the art thing is because we're discussing this idea of what is the, what, what can AI not do? What, where will it fail where we, where we can succeed? And art, people usually argue art. And I think I've proven uh, you can argue whether it has soul, whether it has heart behind it, intent and meaning, and whether it personally speaks to you. Uh, but I think, generally speaking, that, that under the broad concept of is it art, I don't think we can say no. I don't think it's fair to say no. You yeah. can argue it's bad art. You can argue it's not soul, <laughs> but it's certainly art. Uh, yeah, certainly, certainly art. Um, when you brought up things that AI can do before the break, uh, my first thought was art. My second thought was design. Good one. Mm, and sorry, and here's where I'm here's where I'm going with that. I don't think I want to live in a world in which every living space is the same. Um, I don't think that's so necessarily going to be the case. The idea that a you know this apartment that I live in in Oslo is different than others around it because this was built later and has more ceiling height uh, than others necessarily would, right? One example. Uh, of optimality depends on the creator of AI in the first place. So Okay, that's, that's fair, but right, I mean, the, the best use, the best use, best in air quotes, use of space is devised to divide it up into, you know, uh, shapes that fit inside the space to optimize the number of units, et cetera, et cetera. And then you divide up that space to optimize, right? You would go through a set of optimization runs and you'd end up stamping out sort of repetitive. It, well, it assumes, assuming that the end goal is similar in that optimization of space use, whatever, that an AI would come up with, here is the most optimal path to do so. Like you're maxing like unless anything. You, unless you allowed for individuals to feed input. Because I was going to say so, that actually goes into, I think, a lot of yeah. where the balance between automation, AI, and humanity exists. Um, and and so thinking about it from, you know, a lot of the new construction in going on, at least in 
say Oslo metro area is not single family units it's all apartments or condominiums or whatever you whatever you want to call it well i mean there are people behind the design of these things even now and the you have some customization of what goes on inside but in terms of where the walls are and the square meterage and you know the location of your bathroom relative to the rest of the the rest of the place or whatever that's all been stamped out already right so you you pay more the higher up the building you go you pay more and then the really dope places of course are on top right which is which is what you would expect that happens everywhere but uh i just wonder if we turn everything over to everything over to machine learning or or an ai or whatever you want to talk if we automate the design process if we're not stealing the if we're not stealing individuality for the sake of optimization and i don't know that optimization is necessarily the most valuable in that kind of trade off and the trade off between in the trade off between optimal and individualized where i have to live for example okay fair enough i mean like i said i think it comes down to so long as it's the definitions and uh you know the, the way that most things the idea of optimal is not single value it's usually multi-objective right so you wouldn't just say we want to maximize the space or or minimize the amount of space while, while you know meeting minimum living requirements there's also going to be a level of well how much are they willing to pay um uh I don't know uh, how much are they how, like. I don't know what what does this person care about? Have they maybe we'll get to the point where automation is so you know intrinsic to the process that the design of the building is by the person who wants to rent it. You know, like I want to rent an apartment. All right, what kind do you want? Where would you like it? We can build it. Well, I was going to say I, part of the rent, right? Uh, sure, why not? It, it absolutely could be that, and and if it's the kind of thing where I get to feed, I get to feed input parameters to this thing. Like I want a I want a bathtub and I want a shower and I don't want a shower cabinet. I want glass doors for the shower. Sure. Um, and I want the tub to be big enough that somebody could soak in. And I want a kitchen that has an island. And I want the cooktop to be in the island with a with a you know a hood over top that way. And I want drop lights in the uh, in the great room and the kitchen and the bathroom, but I want uh, you know ceiling outlets in the bedrooms. And if well, I could feed, if I could feed all those parameters to a, a computer program and it and it barf out a floor <laughs> plan for me, yeah, great. I I actually I, I, I think that's completely possible. Well, I mean, I don't not only possible, not, um, I'm surprised it doesn't exist today. <laughs> like that's something that the way as you describe that in my mind, I'm seeing that's not hard to do. You feed certain levels of minimal parameters. You maybe let AI run wild with what it means to be structurally sound and efficient, but then once you get like the sure. base of that, you feed it in. Like again, this is I think true of most machine learning, right? Certain parameters and levels of what it means to help interpret what we as humans, you know, affect as luxury, as whatever, as various designs and ideas. And then just having those little sliders and parameters to throw in and have, actually, that would be amazing. I want that so to there's, happen there's with more that, development. Would, wouldn't it? <laughs> Some modeling forms of AI, we would call that um, hard constraints and soft constraints, right? Um, hard constraints being like, we need there to be a floor. We need there to be four walls or at least enough walls to make sure that the outside is not connected to the inside. Um, it needs to be, you know, um, uh, what, traversable by humans. So you can have really found, in yeah. this direction, right? Things yeah. that you might think are obvious, but an AI wouldn't necessarily think that. Right? Well, it, you need to say, yeah, and that's why you, specific. yeah, that's why you give it those, those parameters. Hard constraints, right? Those are the things yep. that are definitive. But then we could also say, well, as well as that, so long as these are all met, this is what you can customize. This is what we allow the AI to actually go wild on. Okay. So, and even so, then we can customize that to an extent. Like you, you must have at least this much space, for example. Yeah, no, absolutely. You, we, those would be the constraints you define. But so to get back towards, though, what can't AI do or where do we still see humans fitting? And what kind of jobs do we? Because it seems like the more we talk about, we're finding 
applications of putting AI into almost everything and automation and everything. Um, and so where do we exist, right? Where do we continue? Because, on, you know, on the extreme, right, I guess I could hopefully argue that humanity will always be able to be the dreamers, the thinkers, the ones who are looking for the whys behind things we're doing and such like that, right? That when it comes to, for me, I always see humans having to maintain a certain level of decision-making in any automated process. Not all decisions, because a lot of basic decisions can be made by AI with enough information. It can be a hard binary yes, no, or other right kind of thing decisions. But when it comes down to the should we, in most cases, in when given those problems, right, it, it goes into those philosophical moral dilemmas of the train tracks and the people on them and things like that. Arguably, um, morality can even be automated, though. You say that, but that's still based on some level of yeah. you have to define what that morality is. And I think humanity is more fluid than that. Um, so long as it's my morality, I don't care. Right. Right. That's that's part of the problem. That's um, why. I, but that's where it comes into, the, again, the decision making piece um, that an AI, what I've seen often done with AIs in small senses is right now, and maybe this goes beyond, AIs are what help decision makers, again, sift through data to understand what their options really are. And so you, you know, I, I like Sir Pencer brings up uh, AI as president of my HOA, which arguably might not be so bad. Um, <laughs> yeah, but better to stick to rules and, you know, have sensible boundaries preset. Not a bad thing at all. <laughs> and Babs brings up an even better version of this, which is checkbox, simple AI, cheating AI, experimental AI for president. Ah, uh, that's, that's entertaining in many ways. That's great music. But, uh, well, having played newer RTSs recently and seeing the various ways their AI, their routines work against you and you choosing a level, sometimes you want, like, I don't know if I want to go against the experimental AI, that thing, ugh. but, uh, using AI to like, again, sift data. So from the HOA example, if the decision has to be about one company versus another, you're going to choose for your HOA for garbage collection or something or for a landscaping company, things like that, the AI can go through and provi provide you answers based on your criteria, right? That you can throw there and say like, I, we need a company that is, can be this flexible, that comes on these days, that costs no more than this kind of thing, right? And hopefully an AI routine could do all the sifting through data to give you answers based on that and hopefully recommend a best answer, but you would still want the human to finally make that final decision to basically look at and uh, say- A verification process, fine. If you want to leave verification to humans, that's a very minor point that swap. Like, when you think of systems in place, like, I don't know, if you think of production, we don't even need humans to really be in the loop until the very end, just to eyeball some of the materials coming out. Yep, that looks fine. Nothing crazy is going on, right? If that's all it comes down to, that still could be one person out of the current 10,000. Well, I'm right? not going to say um, that it means everybody maintains that job, but I feel like that is a type of job that you still need a person doing. I mean, and I say that on a certain level, because there's a lot of smaller decisions that can be made completely automated about, you know, the, the quantifiable decisions. Was the paint thick enough on this car fender? You know, Ferrari goes through this and uses a machine to measure the millimeter thickness of its paint at some man, you know, many, many points throughout the car. And so that is something that's completely automated and it's put on by base parameters that a human said is here's what you have to meet. And then it happens. Right. Um, and so it's not those kind of decisions being made, but it is like maybe in the overall design of the Ferrari, the building of it, the materials being chosen, like, no, to a person, this is what is pleasing. This is the thing we're trying to affect, which does lean itself towards a little bit of that art side of things. Because Which just leads us again to this idea of sort of verification and basic design. Because I think design can actually be done largely by AI as well. Like I think we can say, like I think a car, I think a, an AI could work at what a car is. We just want to specify what the the, the particulars, right? So it's all it's not about process again. It's about inputs. So as long as we're defining the inputs, we're happy. I think. And and as long as I have freedom to express myself as an individual inside the inside the constraints of what a car is because let's say i'm in my mid-50s and i'm having my midlife crisis like a car with the form factor of a hyundai uh ionic or even a, a tesla model 3 ain't gonna get it done 
right? I want I want the Jaguar badge or the BMW badge or the Porsche badge or you know something sure. even more ridiculous, the Ferrari badge, right? And the form factor that comes with those badges. Right? That's that's what I think we need to be careful about as we go through the transition to automation is that we don't lose our ability to express ourselves individually. And I realized that I just say that, say that. And then I thought of a funny thing that uh, I've been thinking a lot about the signal to noise ratio on social media. Okay. uh, A lot lately. And I was thinking about you could, you could absolutely program an AI to do to do influencer free advertising and put vapid crap out on TikTok. <laughs> you, abs- you absolutely could. Oh yeah, for sure, for sure. That'd be easy, actually. Right, I, I would imagine it would that's, be. That's called that's called sentiment analysis. That's a- yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. uh, <laughs> Ken, your real answer of what you should be working on for your next uh, project or whatever is the automated TikTok yep. bot that you, a manufacturer gives you a product and says, I need a TikTok viral video for this. And it creates it through deep fake technology and machine learning, the optimal one that will catch today's audience. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. you as a company yep. could be a single person in a room that just feeds the algorithm, the base information into your creation yep. and have it put yep. it out there such that boom, you make millions upon millions hand over fist as companies just keep coming to you. So, yeah, and we have a we have a half hour left and and I want to come back to this policy discussion because we're talking about maintaining individuality and how do we as humans get to express ourselves inside of a very framework uh, of of automation or artificial intelligence or machine learning. What do you do when half of everybody is making the minimum? Right? Because there or 70% of everybody has the exact same income level because it's all the UBI, right? And there's a handful of people that still go to jobs, but well, most of us don't anymore. Well, I think there should be certainly rewards for those who are still contributing more to society than others, right? I don't think that's a bad thing. Uh, we should certainly be encouraging that to make sure that people do still want to go to work. Although I have a feeling that people might want to anyway, because I think people get bored. Um, and if they're particularly interested in certain topics, why not let them do it, right? Um, yeah. There's the but, argument uh, about whether people are motivated by their need to do something, essentially, or pure entertainment. I think it's both, honestly. I mean, if you think about, okay, and again, I'm going to refer to the culture uh, series by Ian M. Banks. I've talked about this in the past when we last talked about this as well, as a sort of utopic view of what could happen in a truly, you know, idealized, fully automated universe. Um, what kind of societies can show up? And it shows both the sort of utopic and the and the dystopic sort of views of the three different cultures and how they each tried it. Um, in the culture, which is the main, the main one, and that's literally what they're called, is the culture. Um, they uh there are people who still pick up dishes and go and wash them they clean tables there are people who help build ships and the likes and quite often you'll find people asking them as part of the you know the the narrative driven story um why are you why are you doing that and they'll say i enjoy it it relaxes me i do i do this once in a while when i feel like it um and you know the robots that are automated to do this just recognize that when i do it and leave me be when i don't when i don't do it the robots take over again like, why not, right? I, I don't think many people want to actually go clean tables. I mean, if they have the choice, or, uh, maybe that's just my personal opinion. I don't particularly enjoy it when I did it. Um, but I think that, you know, I think that generally speaking, if you want to go and design aircraft for the military or whatever, why not? You can go do that and you can have AI help you instead of instead of just letting them do it. Full stop, right? I, I, I don't see why. And then we, as for pay, though, however, well, back to Todd's original point, um, is everybody going to be paid equal? Like, or maybe seventy percent of people are going to be paid equally. It's tough because if you ask that question a hundred years ago or two hundred, three hundred years ago, people would have thought that meant that everybody was going to be in poverty. I think in the, in a fully automated society, if we get to the point where it's not all being absorbed by the top one percent, which it currently is heading that direction, we have to change things. Um, but if we actually used all this automation for the good of the people in general, 
I don't see why we couldn't all live like kings. Maybe not literally, we wouldn't have castles, but, you know, if you can just, you know, I don't know, put in an order for a new house and, you know, the robots come along and build it, not a single human involved, the resources were all mined automatically, like, why on earth would it cost money? What, what use is money in that context? If you want to start talking about possession of land and so on, then we are limited, of course. But that it just means that our idea of a resource has changed from, you know, labor into just possession. And I think it becomes actually easier to deal with than our current understanding. I think there's actually less variables to handle. Hmm. See, I, I think that you get into an inter interesting conversation with because you know, I, 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 especially when you bring up broad or broad ideals or I, ideas of how society could be, um, I like to lean towards middle line of, I think there are good ideas from extremes and that the right answer lies somewhere in between. And so when I hear of things like UBI, in my mind, it translates to the concept that everybody is in a group agreed upon society has the has enough income if income is still needed to have food shelter and health that those kind of basic needs are taken care of yeah. and that with that i think there still exists a good in incentivizing in some form maybe it's money maybe it's other forms people who want to go above and beyond and do things that help continue to bring more value to society that helps bring everything up in some way because arguably, and I've point. seen a lot that discusses this, that today in humanity across the world is the best time to be alive in the history of humanity because through yep. technology and general wealth, there are less people who are poor, who are truly impoverished compared to the normal people, number of people in the world as compared to ever in history of humanity. Um, and so it's, arguably uh, we're all living in the best time you could. It, it's one of the arguments the globalists will make of why globalism is, is superior to say nationalism, but I don't mean it in terms of a, of a political movement. I mean, I mean it in terms of there the are a bunch of, of nation states that cooperate with each other, but it's not necessarily like supply chains and money and so on and so forth is not like treated on a global scale. Rather, they're treated on a national scale, um, and and the big argument from the globalists as to why global globalism is better um, is that you know since since globalization has taken place, uh, you've seen the largest number of people people taken out of poverty than at any other time in human history, right? And globalization's not that old on a on a societal scale at 50 years at the most, right? And in 50 years, we've managed to raise you know, tens, if not hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. Uh, at the same time, we've taken a certain group of people from a certain part of the world and devalued their labor utterly. Like yes. that's, the, that's the cost of raising those people out of poverty. Of raising the the people that we had that uh, globalization has risen out of poverty, the cost of that is is uh, reducing the value of of a certain group of people in a certain part of the world's labor, um, to where a factory worker who was making thirty dollars an hour in a union job, then had to go work at a call center for fifteen dollars an hour, and now is working at Walmart for ten. Um, for uh, sure, no, you're absolutely correct. And I think I think that the biggest thing that we've, we've the biggest topic that I'm not suggesting we move to, but um, but one of the biggest topics about this uh, overall subject is the transition process is going to be difficult. Um, and I, th I think I think back to Wayne's original point about um, what he sees as UBI being sort of covering the basics. Uh, I agree that for now that's what it should we should be aspiring to in the next five to ten years. Uh, and maybe starting off smaller to the point where maybe everybody gets ten dollars extra a month, right? And then move up from there. Um, but I don't see why not in the future. Eventually, we either ideally move away from a resource-based system that's the, like money, um, and move towards a request allocation-based system based on what's just available and what's reasonable. Um, because I think I think the amount of resources available are going to skyrocket um, in terms of what we want. Um, and also, what Wayne said about this about this um, 
what is deemed a um, a reward in society doesn't actually have to be money. I mean, for and that might sound ridiculous, right? Who would want to get a job just for something that's not money? People do that all the time. Look at the military. People don't join the military for a good income, <laughs> right? You don't, and same with becoming a nurse or a doctor. You don't necessarily do those things because you think it's going to be, oh, I'm going to get boarded. Uh, well, no, let's talk good. about teachers if you're going to bring that up. <laughs> Right? Yeah, teachers, there's, there's so many jobs people do it because they want to be honorable, helpful people with, that, you know, assist society. And I think that's, well, that I think we can use that. So I think there's some good thoughts that have also come into the chat from where uh, Sir Penser said earlier on here. The, the sta- so the standard of living for a nation that makes minimum wage and where AI has automated many things may actually be higher than it is today. With that said, people yep. may feel worse off. Interesting. Um, and Babs follows that one saying, if I don't have to work to live, then I could focus on my passions. If everyone could do that, perhaps that is the next golden age of man slash womankind. Yeah. Um, as- assuming assuming you can afford in whatever form that takes to follow your passions. And that's where, like, we're talking about small levels of UBI. And I think a UBI is going to have to be way higher than even uh, the thousand uh, dollars a month that Andrew Yang was talking about uh, the the freedom dividend as he called it rather than <laughs> calling it a UBI right and and there's plenty of places for the money of where the money could come from like it's not a it's not a necessarily a question of paying for it it's a question of what happens macroeconomically when the overwhelming majority of people have this baseline resource base, right? And I, I hear what you're saying, Ken, that that we're, maybe we need to change what a resource is, and maybe it's not money, maybe it's this other stuff. Uh, I don't know how I feel about the idea of, because I was an engineer and now the writing of requirements has been automated away that I have to, you know, that, that I'm, I'm assigned things, right? I don't, I don't know how I feel about that. I think I would be, my instinct is to be naturally resistant to that. <laughs> I, I feel the same. I, I do feel that as well, because assigned implies the sort of government that you have to trust. And especially with people who are born in the U.S. and raised here, they learn to, to believe that the government is slow and horrible at controlling things and really bad at processing. And, you know, think with the DMV and everything, right? Um, I think there are governments in the world that do it better. And I think that that's a shame that a lot of Americans have that viewpoint because of the American government. But it doesn't necessarily have to be a government body. Why can't it be an AI, right? Why can't an AI decide that? Uh, that, that scares me even more. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, no. So uh, take, for, take for an example... Uh, just a real, a real simple, uh, a real simple example of, you know, when I was discussing with the mistress of giggles moving to Norway, uh, she was worried that uh, moving from my place in Denver to a significantly smaller place in Oslo was going to result in me, you know, feeling claustrophobic and all of this stuff, and I. My response to her was, I really don't care necessarily about the space as long as it's got a floor and a roof, it doesn't leak, and it has <laughs> high-speed internet access. Well, <laughs> That's such an engineer, I like our hey. gamer guys. I have the exact same, man. I I've said you. the same thing. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, but as time goes on, I have discovered that I miss the space. Mm. And I oftentimes look, you know, outside of of um, outside of central Oslo, because as soon as you do that, the price of property uh, it kind of drops off a cliff. Yeah, and like most big cities, you can get some ridiculous, uh, ridiculous places for the exact same money that I paid for the place that I'm living now. You know, I like, and and I'm not joking about this. Three times the size with a pool or jacuzzi, or like decks on or a decks slash verandas. 
slack, I, I, whatever, on every floor of the house. I believe right? you. We, we experienced the same thing looking at Florida. We were like, what happened if we moved to Florida and we realized we could buy a house <laughs> the size of the one we were paying rent for that was worth £200,000, which is about yeah. $300,000. We could get in, in Florida for about $30,000 and it had a pool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> yep. It just depends on where you want to live. <laughs> yep. Right. Now, so, right. And uh, no, go ahead. What, what I, what I don't, what I don't think I want is I don't think I want my personal details and spending habits fed into a machine and the machine goes, oh, you're allowed three sticks of RAM, a uh, new Ryzen processor, and uh, you know a 3070 graphics card because you're, you're a gamer that doesn't stream and this is all you need because we did an analysis and we said this is... And the analysis says this is all you need. Or... Uh, you want a new car. Well, you can't have the Jag or the BMW. All you need, because all you do is drive it around town and, and do the occasional road trip down to your in-law's uh, beach house or a uh, house on the coast. Uh, there's no beach. Um, <laughs> uh <laughs> You know, uh, uh, you don't need you don't need the Jag or the BMW or the Ferrari. All you need is a PT so, Cruiser. So, Todd, what you're bringing up is interesting because I feel like that is a potential extreme of an idea of letting automation and AI control all of our decision making and how we live lives. And we're now just meat puppets here that be fed. But I think it does bring up an issue of like if a solid UBI works. And I agree with some of the conversations that's been having. I wish we could get to all of it about how it could or could not work in society. Um, one of the questions come in, comes up because I believe in a hybrid system where you get a base and then it allows still the incentivization of people who want to do more to be rewarded for it through some means, be it we money. Do. We have to have a hybrid um, system on route. Yeah. Well, so the, because what Todd described is kind of the extreme of no, here's what people need based on your activity. And that's where you get for me, it'd be like, here's what you need to stay alive as a human so that basic human needs are not a concern. You get enough to, if you choose to do nothing, have a house, health, and food, or somewhere to live, uh, food and health. That Because the question comes in, how do you allow or would society continue to influence and allow people like the visionaries, those who are using the means available today through be it a version of what we see in capitalism, stuff like that, a way to earn wages, money, security for themselves and their family as part of the effort they put out in thinking, building up corporations, companies, whatever the case may be. How do you incentivize in a world with a UBI and stuff like that, someone to become the next Elon Musk, the next Bezos or whomever you see as a potential visionary who might be actually pushing society forward and helping humanity in today's system? Because that's one of those conversations that comes up about why capitalism is perhaps very good is because if the net benefit is everybody in the world is doing better than what they were before, then we shouldn't do anything to curtail capitalism because it's part of what's driving it. Um, and so that's, again, where I come into these levels of like hybridizations of systems where if I felt – because I believe personally – I see it as there is so much resource at an elite level, at a top level, that could be reworked into the system in such a way that we can allow everybody to be taken care of. And so for me, I basically advocate for a continuation of our current taxation system in the United States, but perhaps with less ways out of it and more ways to focus that you have it. And that it ins I would incentivize companies – and people who own companies who are making mass money that if they're investing majority of that money that they make back into the company, we wouldn't take from that. But if they keep it as their own personal wealth, their own personal beyond what they are investing into other things, that is where you start looking at. Maybe you need to, you know, be taxed at a higher rate or something like that. Because I do also believe that if you bring up everybody in society through a UBI or something like that, that those people at the top who are earning more have more potential to earn even more because they have more people to generate it from who are healthy, solid people who are doing perhaps things they enjoy. 
And so I'm still working through this myself. I have these little ideas of it, but thoughts to you guys of how do you still incentivize people when automation and AI take over the majority of those minutia jobs and things like that, that maybe a person doesn't have to work. So what makes it so they want to, I have my thoughts in some ways I could build a system to, but what are your guys thoughts? First off, uh, no, go ahead. Um, so first of all, I want to refer back to what we said before about the fact that incentiv- incentivization uh, of, of, of the people does not have to be money only. I think there are uh, like honor, merits, um, the, the things that a lot, of, a lot of communist countries are based on is this concept of, you know, helping the people, being, 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 a, being the kind of stand-up person who helps your neighbors. And I think so is Christianity based on this in some sense. Um, I don't know why we can't just extend that a bit further to, to being helping your country. Um, and, and so anybody that you do, do to help out, then maybe there can be calls for people to stand up and work certain jobs when we're lacking them, right? I don't know why that couldn't happen. We, we kind of already do this just in a, a different way right now than a more expensive way. Um, so I think, I think I don't think the problem would be incentivizing people to work. I think that they would already want to do it. I think they would all already, it's one of those things that you can say like, oh, well, so what does your husband enjoy doing? What does your wife enjoy doing? And and you might pridefully say, you know, oh, my, my husband actually works at the sewage plant. He does what? Wow, what a great member of society. Wow, you must be really proud, right? And that's the way it should be. I, I don't know why we would, I, I, think, I think we should all aspire to provide for society but, and try to fill in where the, the cracks are. So surely, Ken, you would consider it a waste of yours or mine or Doc's talents uh, if we were to find ourselves with uh, an open manhole cover on the street in front of our places with a with a tube down it, um, you know, to to fix the to fix the sewer, mm-hmm. like that that is a waste of our talents. Like sure. our talents, our our talents should be used in other places, right? Absolutely. Like, sure. Okay, so I understand. I think the concept of what you're saying. Uh, this is why I, um, I always find it funny when art people talk, uh, talk good about communism, right? Because the first thing that happens when the communists take over is they're going to grab all the artists and go, "You guys are going to be scrubbing sewers now because we don't need artists. We need sewer scrubbers." Sure. And yeah, right? I was gonna say communism so is like, not you, a good you system. You aren't you you aren't suddenly going to be eating better than you are now. You're going to be up to your hips and crap. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, the, so, the, the majority of people in a communist system have always been worse off because the average has always been low. Right. Sure. That's the problem. But right. the, the the point of this system is that if we have automation and lots of it in place where the majority of jobs we don't want to do are automated anyway, and we can just fill in either where we want to or where we're needed. I don't think there will will need many people climbing into the sewer. I think think that that husband or the wife who's working in the the waste management center is going to be the one person in charge of the waste management center for 10 million people, right? Sure. Because that's all that's needed. Sure. Um, And and so the other thing that I was thinking about – the things that everybody uses that people don't necessarily know that they use, <laughs> like GPS. Yeah. Like everybody uses, well, okay, everybody who's not living in North well, Korea no. or Iran. Everybody benefits uses, from it whether they use it directly. Sure. Because that's how well, your goods are so sent to you in the first place. A, yeah. Everybody who's got a smartphone, right? The timing, the timing signal that keeps your smartphone clock accurate comes from GPS. And I didn't even know that until about two weeks ago. Oh, you didn't? Oh, really? Oh, yeah. No, I didn't. No. Well, it used to come from cell phone no. towers, but even that used to. But anyway, yeah. Continue. <laughs> uh, anybody, anybody who does, uh, uh, anybody who does uh, uh, anything with a map app of any type is utilizing gps so i understand the idea of of uh, using societal utility or using the proceeds of societal societal utility as a benefit as, as a means to create benefits for those 
for the people who created that societal benefit. But I aren't we just changing the nature of the hierarchy in that case? So are, like, are you, what are you, you saying what that at any point? So that, I was just going to say, are you saying at any yeah. point that we're getting rid of the hierarchy? Because I don't know of a system no, where a hierarchy I doesn't exist. I think, we're, I, think we're just, I think we're just shifting it. To, yeah, course, right? Well, so the guy who takes out trash, the guy who delivers the, the, sorry, the person, the person who takes out the trash or the person who delivers pizza or the person who uh, unclogs your drain or the person who fixes your washing machine but then, you know, those people are suddenly significantly more important than the sport star or the uh, Hollywood actor or actress. Right? And also, the, I, mean, I don't think they're maybe, less important or more important. It's just different. I don't know. I, I don't know. I'm not going to try to claim what the society might look like. We don't know. Um, but I'm, I, yeah, I was just trying to say that could be a, could be a reward mechanism, but it also doesn't have to be. Um, I th there's no reason why we couldn't also reward people for being artists who are chasing their dreams as being artists. Okay. I, I mean, on that, I'm fine. I'm, I'm as a rule, fine with that too. Uh, I don't. Here's a, maybe maybe this is because I'm not capable of thinking outside this box but my like <laughs> my struggle is i don't want to be equal with everybody so the like, fun thing the I... reason the reason why i majored in the topics that i majored in is so that i wouldn't be equal with everybody like the the whole the whole point of the process is to find a thing that you can do that's valuable enough for somebody to compensate you which, None of those jobs or a, a vast minority of those jobs exist. So we're compensating people for doing what they want to do, but there are still things that, that need to be done. Uh, which I, think... I would argue, hopefully, I might be wrong here, but I, I hope that this comes from, that, that hope that, all, that many of us have. I, I feel it as well, of course. I mean, the reason we chase dreams is to, to not just to help society, but also to help ourselves, right? Um, sure. And maybe we could argue that uh, personal fulfillment is still going to be a thing. It just wouldn't be amongst thy peers, right? It'd be it'd be a general personal fulfillment. Um, but we can also argue that um, um, no, I, I don't know where I'm going with it. Sorry. <laughs> well, so the thing I keep seeing is that for me, the system doesn't have to be completely thrown out of what we have today. I think that. Like we like today, we incentivize people by money, whatever the case may be, or something resource and stuff like that for what you do. I think that as long as there's something, as long as everyone's basic needs are taken care of, you will have people who now choose how they spend it. And because I know people who are artists because of the sake they just want to be artists. It's not because they're trying to become famous, rich or anything like that. They just want to do what they love. And if that gives them a little bit because some people value it more than others, but otherwise they're basically still living at that basic level and they're okay with it. Cool. But if therefore people want to, for some reason, live a different life than what the basic provides such that you can earn additional money beyond the UBI. But I always think that if a UBI existed and automation is an AI has prevent, provided us a world where human labor, natural things are less needed to get the regular things of resource that society needs to continue that it frees people up to, you know, pursue what they want. And if one of the things they want is a nicer car than what you absolutely need to traverse the, you know, the world, there are means to do that. Like you said, Todd, choosing a profession that would earn you money that would allow you to do that. And I think that can still exist. You know, it's funny for me because I think in all the explorations, I've seen one of the biggest ones that's talked around kind of the subject of where resources aren't based on money in the entire society is that of Star Trek because in Star Trek, nobody's getting paid officially from what you can see, at least within the Federation itself in the human society. But the weird part for me that at that same time, even though that's been explored for a while or somehow talked about in many ways, unless I've missed it, I never saw a good discussion on what the every man does. Who's not a part of Starfleet and how their oh, life so is presented. You know, because when you have a world where resources isn't an issue, right? Well, so the the thing about Star Trek is resources are infinite. 
Essentially, yes. yes. Yeah. That, but that, that, there you go. Like, well, if resources are infinite, they have no cost, right? I mean, but it's a question of then what do people do with their time and how they do it? Because, you know, one of the conversations that gets us closer to it here in the U.S. or in the Earth, right, is that somehow we made energy non necessary. Like, if there was enough solar, tidal, geothermal, all production of energy and infrastructure, that essentially every person on Earth has enough access to energy at any given point in the day, night, time of year, that that's no longer something you have to pay or seek out, what would that do to our society? There's still raw resources sure. and stuff you need to do other things, to create other things, but well, if energy was right. one piece taken away, what would we do differently? There was a period of time a couple of years ago where uh, the instantaneous rate of electricity went negative. Right? Because there were so many people that had home... There's so much uh, right. renewable infrastructure, both publicly and privately, that there they had that there was such a surplus of energy that they were incentivizing people to use it. <laughs> right, which I love that. I love that idea in theory. Uh, I think I love the idea better that we could do things with energy to store it. So at peak periods, we could distribute it where we needed to. Um, rather than rather than well, we've got it and you got to use it. So yeah, keep no, that that is an, an inefficiency. Yeah, that's an but inefficiency I mean, of the system. But well, yes, sure. But so, I mean, it's it, that's a that's also a, 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 an aspect of physics, right? You can't keep that stuff in a battery. You can't keep energy in a battery forever. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I would like to point out that just while we're discussing energy, and we'll probably go back to the main topic in a second, but uh, nuclear energy already solves all of these problems. And uh, uh, there's a great talk that I just put in the chat um, by a specialist uh, who talks about this and uh, why he changed his mind from being really anti-nuclear hippie kind of guy to, wait a minute, this actually solves all the problems and it's just public perception is the problem right now. Oh, I'm um, a massive, so I'm actually a massive advocate for nuclear power. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's not the ideal, but it's definitely better than everything we have right now while we perfect the renewables. Yeah, and so and please, by the please way, check the talk, everybody. And by the way, the way you solve the NIMBY problem, the not in my backyard problem, is you put it in everyone's backyard. Well, and sure. as well as there's actually a solved case there where you build smaller plants and more of them. Because one of the yeah, challenges yeah. we have today is that you do one massive one for massive area, and therefore it is a higher risk. But there's also the piece that with modern technology and innovation, the risks that associated with nuclear power have reduced so much from the last plants we've built. Um, well, yeah. what, what is yeah. the, a lot the, to be the said. two biggest uh, the two biggest nuclear disasters ever recorded in the history of nuclear power were both were both the direct result of of human uh, of human yeah. error yeah. or human uh, influence or human intervention or whatever. Which. To tie this whole subject together as we come to the top of the show here, with the way that we have is automation AI and the reduction of what you would have with human error involved, we should all be able to get access to pretty consistent, clean, safe power through things like nuclear if we just built it all with the modern, what's available today, the technology and resources we have, that those kind of things would be limited if not available because you have enough automation AI to push it forth to free us from our binds of at least electrical need and hopefully allow us to spend that energy elsewhere. Absolutely. Uh, um, Legend, Legend Tinker, sorry, in the chat mentioned Fukushima. Uh, I don't remember if there was a human involved in that or not. That would be the exception to the I heard it I was, was thinking of, which would be Three I Mile Island and Chernobyl. That yeah, no, both, I think Fukushima, uh, I heard, was a maintenance issue, but I have to go back. It's been a while. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't know that one for certain. My my final point on all of this is, since we haven't really talked about AI um, that much, we really just talked about automation. Um, in the 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 chat there, I just dropped the Wikipedia article to genetic algorithm, which is a type of evolutionary algorithm um, and a meta heuristic, which is used to uh, um, optimize effectively um, a solution from either nothing or really bad and random to something that makes sense. Um, and the reason I want to draw your attention to this in particular is just the image on the right-hand side. Uh, in 2006, the, the NASA ST-5 spacecraft had an antenna created that looked like that. Um, and feel free to share that on the screen if you can, Wayne. Um, and that is a design that I believe no human would have tried. 
no human would have attempted to make that shape as the one for the spacecraft. We wouldn't have thought that was the best for detecting radiation patterns. Certainly because, not. Yeah, certainly not inside the time frame of a program like that. Absolutely. Right? Um, and that's because we we would never think like that's not in, in a design pattern. We couldn't base it on anything. That's just out of the bag, federally specialized evolutionary random. Mm -hmm. um, what happens when we try again and again and again, millions of times on the computer in a few minutes? What what's the best it can produce? And that's the answer. And that's produced a better solution than we ever can. Now, if that's just one antenna. This one piece of wire needs to be bent in a specific way. Can you imagine the scale of, of, of efficiency, optimization, and how our problems can go away if AI can produce solutions that are so out of our scope of thinking, like that antenna, but for large, complex problems like societal, political, and so on? Um, and I just want to leave you with that, yeah. that thought. Yeah, uh, yeah. economics. Or do uh, we end up see... with... Or do we end up with Skynet and the robots kill us all? No, we don't. Uh, <laughs> uh, and with that, you have been listening to, if that's okay, I can do the, I can do the spiel if it's okay. Take it home. All right. You've been listening to Show X live on twitch.tv forward slash VTW Show X or on Versus the World videos on YouTube. Thank you very much for listening either place. Uh, drop us a like, hit the subscribe and the little bell alarm to know when we're going live. We very much appreciate these things. Uh, that's very helpful. Um, the best place to find absolutely everything to do with the show, everything in total, rather than me having to do the entire spiel, which I'm going to do anyway, because I like to do it. <laughs> but if you want to find all of it in one place and you don't want to type all this out, the only place you need to go to is Linktree, but it's a bit special. There's a dot in the middle of the tree. So it's linktr.ee forward slash show X. You go there, you will find all of our links, easily accessible and clickable. How nice is that? It means you don't have to frantically type out everything. Um, <laughs> our emails in there, our Facebook, Twitter, Discord, Octails Facebook, Reddit, YouTube, Twitch, our Patreon, and links over to the the where my pros at version um, of the link tree, which has their own as well over there. Um, so check out all of those places, please. Um, support us, especially by letting your friends know and sharing us across your social medias. That's the number one thing. Um, additionally, if you want to help us out, you can subscribe on patreon.com forward slash show X, um, minimum of $1 per month. If you'd rather just do a one-off donation, you don't like doing that whole subscription thing, we totally understand. You can hit the donation button below and that'll, you can donate directly to us through Twitch and through PayPal and whatever else you prefer. Um, and that's a good way of keep, uh, us keeping uh, the hardware and software up to date and allowing the show to continue running. One of the things that we've spent the money on recently is this new overlay we're using. I hope you do enjoy this because um, we, Wayne's been a, a good chunk of time in the past couple of days making this look good for the show. Um, so I, I hope you guys like it very much. Um, and thank you very much, for Wayne, for, for getting everything prepared and uh, hosting the show as always. Thank you, Todd, for the fantastic discussions as well. Uh, I always enjoy. I always look forward to every Sunday. Um, Me too. And, Thank you all for listening in as well. Awesome. So with that, thank you, everybody. Have a good week. We'll see you next time. And a hefty slash salute. We're out of here, guys. Bye. Goodbye. See you next zombie. See you next zombie. <laughs>